With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, the USDA is investing more money into wildfire prevention. And we'll have this week's almond update. But we start today with Cindy Zimmerman at the National Ethanol Conference held this week in San Diego. I'm Harold Woolley, a farmer from South Central Minnesota, currently serving as National Corn Growers Association President. All right. Well, you're here at the National Ethanol Conference, and you're on a panel this morning uh, talking about some of almost some of the issues that the ethanol industry is facing right now. We also heard from Secretary Vilsack here, and um, and he had some comments that you know uh, some of the issues that the ethanol industry is facing, like year-round E15, and and also using the GREET model. So I wanted to just get some of your your thoughts about, especially about. Um, those big issues that the ethanol industry is facing right now? Uh, You know, year-round E15, I think, is the immediate issue. And uh, Secretary Vilsack, he indicated that the eight Midwestern governors uh, request to EPA to allow E15 to be sold in their states will probably not be enacted until 2025. So if we don't get a legislative fix and we don't get the Midwest governor's request, then the next avenue is to request the EPA to issue waivers for E15 to be sold this summer. Well, yeah, and that's what he indicated was, yeah, we'll just have waivers again, (laughs) whatever. What about the GREET model? We're looking at that this is, we're going to have some changes made within days. It's supposed to be announced. Um, We've heard rumors that it might not be as, you know, as favorable as we're hoping. But what what do the corn growers want to see in a revised GREET model? Well, I want to see a model that accurately depicts what we're doing on the farm. You know, we need to, to be able to show that we have lower carbon intensity corn as a feedstock for ethanol and sustainable aviation fuel. So I want that model to be able to show the improvements that we're making down on the farm and carry that through and and be a plus for us as we move forward. Of course, as tied into the Inflation Reduction Act and um, and getting these, uh, I don't really even know how it's supposed to work to you. (laughs) (laughs) There are are some credits there that are available and and, uh, we need to have our modeling decided and in place and farmers need to qualify for that right away is my understanding in order to be eligible for for the tax credit so it's a complicated system you're absolutely right i don't think it should be this hard we we really would appreciate it if there were a simpler methodology to get this accomplished well sustainable aviation fuel is definitely the uh, the phrase of the day here we're talking about that more and more What do you think the potential is for SAF? Well, there's huge potential. You know, I like to say our immediate priority is a year-round E15. Our our right, our our soon uh, priority is Next Generation Fuels Act, and our future opportunity is sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, The aviation industry burns a lot of fuel, and they are dumping a lot of carbon in right into our atmosphere. They are receiving considerable pressure to clean up their their emissions and sustainable aviation fuel is the way to do that and ethanol to jet is the way to get that accomplished. Uh, uh, we can provide a, a low carbon feedstock corn to that industry. We need the modeling to be correct uh, to show the improvements that we're making down on the farm. Uh, we need to get this done. How optimistic are you about the ethanol industry as a corn grower right now? Well, I'm very optimistic. You know, uh, certainly nobody denies that electric vehicles are going to be part of our transportation system as we decarbonize it. But right now, ethanol has a 46% better carbon score than straight-up gasoline. The more ethanol we burn, the sooner we decarbonize, the more we decarbonize our transportation industry. So uh, I and others in the corn industry are advocating for higher blends. The more ethanol we get, the better it is for the environment. Right. We're here in California where E85 is like the cheapest thing that you can buy 
as far as fuel is concerned, right? Absolutely. You know, uh, California is an interesting place, but E85 is a fuel of choice here because it is priced appropriately. It's a couple dollars a gallon cheaper and uh, works great in flex fuel vehicles or ordinary vehicles that have been converted to a flex fuel system. There are conversion kits for those who are interested in that. What have you seen and heard here at the conference that has made the most impact? Um, A lot of talk about the carbon intensity down on the farm and how we score that and how we uh, prove to the industry that the improvements that we're making on our farm are actually reducing the carbon in our corn. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Here at the National Ethanol Conference, I'm Cindy Zimmerman. In today's National Spotlight, agronomists around the Corn Belt marveled at the 2023 corn crop's ability to yield in the face of less-than-ideal weather conditions. Michael Clements reports. Ryan Weimer, an LG Seeds agronomist based in Illinois, says strong yields are a testament to the dramatic gains in the ability of a hybrid to tolerate stress. When you go back to the month of June, there was a lot of guys who were wanting to cut back some of their inputs just because we were going through such stressful conditions and the crop looked so rough when you were going out in the middle of the afternoon walking your fields. But when you look back at a lot of the growers who stuck with their game plans that they had in place and looked at the different things on their farm that continuously give them high yield and contribute to their success. It really paid off when they took the combines through the field. They were seeing those gains. They were seeing those advantages. And so I think when you look at the resilience of this crop and even the stress that we went through, it's important to never give up on a corn crop or a soybean crop until that combine goes through the field. Weimer says the most important lesson from the 2023 growing season was to never give up on a crop. He provides more insights. Growers are quizzing me not only about their seed selection and the hybrids they should be planting on their farm, but they're also quizzing me on different farming practices that they can implement to make their farming operation better. So one of the things that I always encourage growers to do, whether you're planting, whether you're spraying, whether you're harvesting, just look at the work that you're doing in the field. And is there anything that you would like to change? Is there anything that you want to implement moving forward? There's a lot of different options for growers out there to improve their farming operation and to help put more bushels in the grain tank at harvest time. As farmers prepare for 2024, Weimer advises them to incorporate practices and products that complement their management plan. I think if you were to ask any growers back in the month of June that we were going to have the crop that we had this fall, I think they would have thought you were crazy. But if you look back at the growing season, there's really a couple of different things that we can look at and contribute to the high yields that we saw. So one of the things that I think was really key was the fact that we had a really nice planting season. And so we were planting those seeds and putting those plants in an ideal growing and environment to thrive. The other thing was we didn't have a lot of drowned out spots in our fields. So when you take those places out, when you look at a yield map, it's amazing how fast your farm average goes up taking those drowned out spots out. Because no two growing seasons are the same, Weimer wants farmers to consider genetic diversity when selecting seed. We don't want to put all of our eggs into one basket. And so when it comes to that seed selection piece, one of the first things I always focus on are what are those key hybrids that have continuously given you good results on your farming operation over the years? So that kind of gives us our base. And then from there, we also want to look at some of the different hybrids that are out there in the marketplace. Those hybrids are giving us a lot of different things. Most importantly, they're giving us a lot of times more yield. But not not only from the yield aspect, we want to look beyond that as the agronomics, the plant health, and some of the genetic diversity that those hybrids can bring us for our farming operation because we saw what 2023 threw at us this past year and we don't know what 2024 is going to give us. So we want to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward to give us success when the combines roll through the field. For support reaching your yield goals, reach out to your local LG Seeds agronomist or visit lgseeds.com. Michael Clements reporting. A long stretch of the northern tier of the nation reports an appreciable lack of snow accumulation so far this winter. Yet, what might this mean from an ag perspective? Here's Rod Bain. Ever heard of a snow drought? USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says what is taking place in parts of the northern U.S., an event associated with the El Nino weather pattern. That includes some of our mountainous areas of the northwest, such as the northern Cascades and the northern Rockies. But that snow drought extends eastward across the northern plains into the upper Midwest and the upper Great Lakes region. All those areas have come up short on snowfall. Concerns grow about a lack of soil moisture going into the growing season. We have a number of locations across the northern plains and upper Midwest where season-to-date snowfall ranges from just 4 to 12 inches. And in locations 
locations like Fargo, North Dakota, the season-to-date snowfall less than 10 inches, which is less than one quarter of what you would normally expect for the season to date through late February. A plus side for ag and impacted areas, an easy winter to date for lambing and calving or off-season farm activities. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's Will Jordan with the Livestock Report. In today's livestock news, the good news is that U.S. milk production is expected to grow in 2024. Michael McConnell of the USDA's chief economist office says the bad news is the growth rate will slow compared to last year. Overall, we see milk production projected to continue growing, but at a decreasing rate from what we've seen in recent years. Feed prices are projected to be lower in the upcoming year, but we're expecting tighter global markets for dairy products, which are going to provide price support. And as a result, we're expecting to see a fair amount of price competition in the upcoming year as uh, both domestic and international users compete for products that are in relatively tighter markets. Yet there's good news for U.S. dairy farmers as it should cost less to feed their animals in 2024. The outlook for feed markets is for lower prices in 2024 and 2025. This should be supportive for margins of milk producers overall. In 2023, we saw a sharp decline in the milk feed ratio. It was the lowest level we had seen it going all the way back to 2012. Later on in the year, 2023, we saw it begin to recover a bit as lower feed prices came to market. (laughs) But generally speaking, we're expecting feed prices to to abate a bit in 2024, which is good news when it comes to margins. McConnell says they expect cow inventories to remain stable this year. Though the levels are projected to be lower in 2024 than they were last year, we are expecting to see a bit of a flatter trajectory than what we saw. We saw a bit of contraction taking place in quarters three and four of 2023. We're currently projecting a small uptick in the fourth quarter, you know, as we begin to see prices and margins improve over the course of the year. That's Mike McConnell of the USDA. In other livestock news, the American Sheep Industry Association reports that Fibershed is hiring a healthy soils manager. Fibershed's Climate Beneficial Agriculture Program is looking to hire a Climate Beneficial Healthy Soils Project Manager in Northern California. The position will manage Fibershed's California Department of Food and Agriculture Healthy Soils Program block grant. Interested candidates should submit their resume, cover letter, and contact information for three references. Find more information at Fibershed's website. I'm Will Jordan for Agnet West. Don't forget if you've missed any of our morning shows or just need to catch the news at a different time, you can subscribe to our podcast and have statewide agriculture news at your convenience. Just search for the Agnet News Hour on your favorite podcast downloading app. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Hours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agnet West headlines, here's Agnet West Farm News Director Brian German. Texas A&M AgriLife Research is leading a multi-institute effort to develop disease-resistant spinach varieties. The project's being funded by a nearly $3.6 million USDA grant and aims to combat common spinach diseases like white rust and downy mildew. Collaborating with universities and research centers nationwide, the team is utilizing molecular breeding techniques to accelerate the traditionally time-consuming breeding process. The project involves identifying molecular markers associated with disease resistance and validating them to select the most effective spinach varieties. By reducing reliance on pesticides and increasing crop performance, the project seeks to improve economic outcomes for spinach farmers. Additionally, the research aims to develop outreach programs to provide practical solutions for producers to mitigate spinach diseases in the short term while working on long-term cultivar development. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is investing over $70 million through the Plant Protection Act Section 7721 program. Samantha Simon of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service highlights some of the projects supported through the program. This year, funded projects include nearly $2.1 million to combat the spotted lanternfly. Additionally, more than $6.2 million in PPA 7721 funding supports agricultural pest detector dog teams in California, Florida, and nationally for domestic pest detection this year. Tribal organizations, plant protection, research, survey, outreach, and invasive pest mitigation efforts are receiving a little over $1.5 million in six states. We're also providing $1.5 million to support honeybee surveys in 41 states and territories. California's efforts to define regenerative agriculture continue moving forward with the development of a new work group and ongoing public listening sessions. The first meeting of the regenerative agriculture work group took place last month. 
Established by the California Department of Food and Agriculture, the 13-member group represents a diversity of ag stakeholders and members of the State Board and Environmental Farming Act Science Advisory Panel. The group will work to develop a recommendation to define regenerative agriculture for the purpose of state policies and programs. As part of the development efforts, public listening sessions began back in December. The third session on the subject is scheduled for this afternoon beginning at 4.30. Information about today's listening session, along with recordings of previous public listening sessions and workgroup session, is available at cdfa.ca.gov slash regenerative ag. The U.S. Department of Agriculture recently announced the selection of 19 educational institutions to take part in the 2024 Agricultural Export Market Challenge. Four of the teams that will be competing in the spring semester of the challenge are based in California, including Hartnell College, Fresno State, Cal Poly Pomona, and San Diego Mesa College. The challenge is an immersive learning experience for junior and senior year undergraduate students to explore the work of USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service and accrue knowledge and skills in diplomacy, economics, marketing, and trade policy. During the five-week challenge, teams of students develop and present a market entry strategy for a fictitious American company seeking sales opportunities for a U.S. food or agricultural product in an overseas market. The team that competes and wins the challenge receives an opportunity to meet with USDA leaders in Washington, D.C. Sales Account Manager for AgroLiquid, Dylan Rogers, joins us today to talk about their almond research, which has found that lower use rates can provide higher yields. So AgroLiquid has been in business for 40 plus years. We've been doing research uh, at our North Central Research Station in Michigan and throughout North America. We've been able to prove that with these newer technologies, we can achieve lower use rates with the same, if not better, efficiency than conventional type products. Um, these lower use rates translate to greater efficiencies for the growers, whether that be fewer trips through the field, fewer tank fills, uh, just less handling of product overall. Um, and that in turn usually leads to a lower fertilizer budget and a, har a higher return on investment. If you can put in front of a grower that you've got a product that's more efficient, that saves them time, in turn saving them money in today's markets, that's a big deal. Uh, you can find more information about these research projects on our website at agroliquid.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. A look at current fuel price trends and they're trending higher. That's coming up on This Land of Ours. For the fourth straight week, the nation's average price of gasoline has gone up rising 8.7 cents from a week ago to $3.26 per gallon. The national average is up 16.7 cents from a month ago, but 11.6 cents per gallon lower than a year ago. The national average diesel price increased 10 cents last week and stands at $4.09 per gallon. That's 38 cents lower than one year ago. Gas Buddies' Patrick DeHan says, One of the most critical elements to how much gas prices will climb is how quickly and effectively refiners can finish their pre-summer maintenance, start producing EPA-mandated summer gasoline, and build up supply of it before Memorial Day. The price of oil has seen some sideways movement, but overall strength continues, with oil prices now closing in on $80, its highest level since November. Bad guys want to take your identity, but here are some ways to prevent identity theft or to spot it early. Here's Gary Crawford. Today, we're going to talk a bit about the growing problem of identity theft. I'm Gary Crawford, and we no, have... No, I'm Gary Crawford. That's ridiculous. I'm Gary Crawford. I've always have no, been. No, I'm the real Gary. No, no, you are an imposter. No, no, you are. Here's uh, my Social Security number and, oh, uh, uh, your, uh, I mean, my bank statements and credit cards. So out of the chair, square. You can't talk to me like that. I'll talk any way I like to me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, what just happened here? Someone who's trying to be you. <laughs> Doing a good job of it, too. That's Janae McNally. She is an extension expert at Kansas State University. She says somehow, some way, somebody must have gotten hold of my personal information, enough of it to start charging stuff to my account and doing all sorts of things, in essence, pretending to be me. Why me, I will never understand. Uh, I'll never know exactly also how my private information got out there, but Janae says I probably could have nipped this doppelganger's plot in the bud if I had just noticed earlier some things that were going on, some clues. For example, if you sh should stop receiving bills you expect, 
maybe your utility bills, maybe that's an indication that someone has used your identity and made an address change in your name. Ooh, or we might get bills for um, health care services we didn't have. I know I did not ask for the facelift that's on here. And so, uh, Janae says... We should regularly review our monthly statements for transactions that are strange to us or maybe that we don't recognize. But most importantly, she says, do three things. Check your credit, check your credit, and check your check credit. Check your credit. Get your credit report, look at it closely. There are three credit reporting companies. Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. All three of these collect and share the financial information on individuals. Each of those companies will give you one free report a year, and there are lots of things in that report, including, for example, current and past addresses, mortgages, loans, store credit cards, and utility bills. You know, it tells the financial accounts if you're in good standing. For example, do you pay your bill on time? Now, if you have questions about the credit reports and such, Janae says there's a good place to go. Go online to creditreport.com, creditreport.com, or call, and here's the number, 877-322-8228. That's 877-322-8228. As to uh, preventing our personal information from being stolen in the first place, Janae says shredding all the paper that might have account numbers on it is a good idea. Also, bring in your mail as soon as possible after it's delivered. And finally, if someone contacts you and ends up asking for any personal information over the phone, do not give it to them. And if you're doing business online, use a strong password with your accounts. Mine are so strong, I can't remember them myself. Next time, we'll talk about how to keep from being a victim of phone scams. This is Gary Crawford. Oh, no, you're not. No. no I'm Gary Crawford. Fine. Reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Early season crop inputs can cause stress to soybeans. Chad Smith has the details. As you're looking ahead to 2024 planting, you're thinking about maximizing potential yield with your varieties and inputs and minimizing yield loss from weeds, diseases, and other factors. But your early season crop protection inputs can stress your soybeans and hurt your bottom line. Travis Gustafson, an agronomic service representative with Syngenta, talks about why it's so important for growers to prevent early season crop injury. Well, primarily for soybeans, we really want our soybeans to to emerge evenly, uniformly, and quickly at the beginning of the season in order to maximize our yield potential at the end of the season. If they encounter a stress of any kind when they're coming out of the ground, when they're most vulnerable, we will most likely see a yield reduction at the end of the season due to either stand loss or lack of vigor. And so anything we can do to prevent those things and promote good plant health and good growth at the beginning of the season will help us at the end of the season. Gustafson talks about about his recommendations to help farmers maximize their soybean yield potential without causing stress to their bottom lines. I like to use Cruiser Max Apex seed treatment because it offers us a full spectrum of disease control and enhanced protection on diseases like Pythium and Phytophthora, which can be huge stand robbers at the beginning of the season if we get a particularly wet spring when things are emerging. So Cruiser Max Apex is my standard seed treatment. And then if I have some sudden death syndrome or soybean cyst nematodes, then I'll put Saltro seed treatment with that Cruiser Max Apex. And then we get protection from both of those diseases. Plus, we don't have the stress that other seed treatments can cause. Then it's on to herbicides. As I move into my herbicide applications, I'm going to look at Tendovo herbicide, which is a three mode of action residual product that gives us excellent crop safety and long residual for weed control. And, and we don't stress that crop with the active ingredients that are in Tendovo. So the package of the Cruiser Max Apex plus Sultro plus Tendovo pre-emerge herbicide really gets our soybeans off to a good start, and we don't see that stress early on in the season. Gustafson talks about the final considerations to keep in mind when making early season input decisions. I think the biggest thing that people are doing right now is they're looking at what they can use product-wise for their uh, soybeans, whether it's seed treatments or herbicides. And right now they're looking at how much does it cost me? And so discounts are attractive right now when we're sitting down and pricing things. But what really pays the bills at the end of the season is bushels in the bin because those pay the bills. If you're chasing after a discount that's going to offer you a small percentage discount on a small percentage of your overall crop input picture, that just really isn't going to add up unless you've got the bushels to back it up. So if we've got a 
crop protection program, seed treatments and herbicides that don't stress the plant, don't stress the crop and provide excellent control of the pests we're trying to control. We're going to maximize the amount of bushels that go into the bin. To learn more about Cruiser Max Apex, Saltro and Tendovo, connect with your local retailer or Syngenta sales representative. Always read and follow label instructions. Chad Smith reporting. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Brian German has today's featured interview. And making our way through the Case IH booth at World Ag Expo, uh, who am I going to be talking with now? Uh, my name is Brian Spencer. I'm the Hay and Forage Marketing Manager for Case IH North America. And we're standing in front of a pretty new piece of equipment that uh, I understand you folks are pretty excited about. And uh, what are we looking at here? So we're standing in front of our high-density baler, our LB436 model. Uh, what we're introducing is hands-free baler automation. Automation has, or autonomy, has been the buzzword in agriculture for several years now. And we've had uh, some form of baler automation in our uh, in our balers for several years, like with our round balers. Um, we have tractor baler automation. So uh, once the bale is made, it will stop the tractor, it will apply the net wrap, it will open and close the tailgate, ejecting the bale, and the operator didn't touch a thing. He didn't clutch, he didn't brake, he didn't grab a hydraulic handle. In our large square balers, we've had an option called, or a feature called feed rate control, where the baler will control the speed of the tractor based on the amount of hay coming into the baler. Uh, so this new automation that we're, we're launching is next level, next generation. It's it's hands-free bailing now. Um, so guidance has been accepted in agriculture for several years, right? So they use it for tillage, they use it for planting, they use it for spraying, all sorts of applications, right? So nobody drives a tractor, right? So uh, you can't do that with, with hay bailing because, you know, the satellite doesn't know where the windrow is at. It can be anywhere. How many times did it get raked together, you know, and moved over from side to side? You just can't go by, by distance one side to the other. So we're using a technology called LIDAR. Uh, it's not a new technology. It's been around for several years, uh, used in several different uh, industries. So now we're introducing it to agriculture. LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. So a sensor mounted on top of the tractor cab will shoot lasers in front of the tractor and measure the position and volume of the windrow. So it will steer based on the position of the windrow with some fine tuning from the, the bell, bale fill indicators just to additionally steer left or right, make sure the, the bale's equal and feeding correctly. Um, so you, that takes the steering aspect away from the, the operator, and then the feed rate control takes the speed aspect out of the, uh, away from the operator. So he's in there just having a heck of a day, right? So um, you can take a less experienced, less confident operator because um, labor is hard to find, right? Especially finding somebody that is experienced. Um, you can put that type of person in, in the cab, let the tractor and baler take over for him, and your, your productivity goes up. You're going to make more bales per hour, more bales per day. So your, your cost per bale goes down when you're achieving that. So some good advantages to this new system. And that's uh, one of the things, you, you, you touched on it, but it uh, sounds like you get in the cab, you program what you, what you need, and um, you, know, you don't need an advanced physics degree to be able to, to operate something like this. You know, that's one of the things. Oh, it's electronics. It's super, super complex. You know, how am I going to do this? Grandpa can't do this. Like, no, this is super easy, right? You set a bail length, the number of slices, and you, away you go. So, you know, another thing with having, you know, taking those controls away from the operator, this is letting the baler do what it wants, and it's dropping absolutely cookie cutter bales very consistent right so so same length very close in weight so that's better for when you're stacking when you're uh put them on a truck put them in a barn you know retail opportunities everything's very close and very similar you know it's better for retail it's better for feed ration mixing if all your your, your bales are very very close in weight so another advantage to using this feature these tractors are you know, equipped with telematics so what these tractors can do while this baler is running in the field, we can harvest that bale drop data out of the baler, send it into the tractor, send it up to the cloud, and then using your, your smartphone, your iPad, your desktop, 
you can manage your your field, right? I can later that, that evening, you know, the, the day's done. I want to see what my operators did today, so I can pull up every field. I can see how many bales that, that were in that field. I can click on every bale if I wanted to and see what time of day it was made, what the average weight or what the weight was, what the moisture was, what the number of flakes were in that bale. And then I can do a roll up and my okay, my my total weight for this field was my average weight was my average bales per hour was and i know okay i've got 172 bales i gotta go chase out of this field i can call my broker and like hey i got this this much to sell today what are you, you going to give me for it so all that information is available to those operators to those owners those growers to help manage their business better very cool and just lastly anyone not able to make it out to the farm show here uh where can people you know learn more about this piece of equipment sure visit your local case ice dealer or go to caseice.com That was Brian German with today's featured interview. We'll be right back. You are listening to the AgNet News Hour. Now for more news, USDA is investing more money into reducing wildfire risks. Gary Crawford has more. The USDA is investing another half a billion dollars to expand efforts to reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfires. This will continue our work uh, in terms of hazardous fuel reduction, a prescribed burn, and other treatments. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack telling reporters Tuesday it's all part of a plan to help 21 selected landscape areas protect themselves against wildfires. But he said part of that $500 million new investment will be for a new program. This is uh, allowing us to begin to expand beyond the 21 priority areas into areas which we refer to as the Wildland Urban Interface, or WUI. And this is going to allow us to help build local uh, capacity to provide tools and resources uh, so that we can uh, provide those communities with assistance and help uh, to reduce uh, the risk of fire. California's Natural Resources Secretary Wade Crowfoot called the expanded investments truly a game changer. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. What role does USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service play in supporting growers wishing to move toward organic commodity production via the Organic Transition Initiative? Rod Bain looks into it. Producer applications continue to be accepted for USDA's Organic Transition Initiative. And as Lindsay Haynes, Natural Resources Conservation Service National Organic Specialist, points out, We feel like NRCS can really help through this Organic Transition Initiative through a new organic management standard to pick up all these pieces that aren't in our current existing standards and help support people learn all these new ways of organic production. That's because even though NRCS offers technical and financial financial support through conservation practices such as cover crops, crop rotation, and residue management. Haynes acknowledges these practices take on their own significance as growers transition to organic production, the shift from a chemically based to a biologically based system. We want to help people learn all these different ways of organic production. So it takes mentoring, it takes hiring experts, it takes spending time every day in your decisions on how you're going to do things. NRCS's new organic management standard is part of its environmental quality incentives program tied to the organic transition initiative. Now, there might be some confusion regarding the OTI sign-up process in that each state has its own application deadline. While it would be nice to have one deadline for everyone across the country, it doesn't really support the local needs as well. Every state has different batching deadlines. And in some cases, state deadlines have already passed. Yet Haynes points to the importance of interested producers submitting OTI applications to their local NRCS office by the March 1st national deadline. We want to get folks in the office to sign up, whether the deadline is passed or not. So then if a state deadline is not missed, they will be definitely considered for this year. If a state deadline has been passed, once the national folks take a look at the demand and the need, an additional allocation will go to the states. And then states can then decide if your deadline is passed, do they want to fund a few more or do they want to delay till next year? And those that haven't passed the deadline, they will be considered for this year. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Research is key to figuring out how to prepare and prevent foreign animal diseases, especially important for U.S. hog producers. David Geiger has this report. A foreign hog disease could cost the industry huge production losses if it makes it to the U.S. Japanese encephalitis virus is a transboundary disease for hogs, and it's on the move through mosquitoes. That's why the Swine Health Information Center and the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research are partnering together looking for proposals. Dr. Megan Niederwerder with Schick says they have a million dollars. To create a research program 
that's really focused on how do we prevent and prepare for Japanese encephalitis virus for the U.S. swine industry. The U.S. is currently negative for the virus, but it's recently moved into new areas of the world, including Australia in 2022. Its hog population had also never seen the virus, and it spread widely among hog locations. The cost was huge. They had a 6 to 10 percent production losses on sow farms. So this virus causes disease such as abortions, delayed farrowing, uh, mummified fetuses, and uh, neonatal pigs that are born very weak or with shaker syndrome. Niederwerder says that type of loss is comparable to the first year the U.S. had porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. Certainly a production impact that we want to avoid uh, at all costs, right, to make sure that we don't have this virus enter and cause those production losses to hog farmers. There are different ways the Japanese encephalitis virus could make it over to the U.S. An adult mosquito could sneak in through ships or airplanes. Niederwerder wants more research done. Trying to look at uh, prevention of entry of infected mosquitoes and also, of course, looking at how do we uh, pre proactively put in place mosquito control strategies on swine farms now to um, help reduce that risk. The public-private partnership has a million dollars thanks to matching funds between the pork checkoff-funded Chick and Farm Bill-supported FFAR. Niederwerder wants diverse research proposals from mosquito control strategies. Such as looking at ventilation and increasing air speed or fan speed in the, the hog barn, all the way to novel vaccine strategies and potential surveillance targets. Niederwerder says applications and more information can be found on their website, swinehealth.org. We're looking for a diverse range of research proposals in this program and look forward to uh, receiving those, reviewing those for value to pork producers and how those can help the U.S. industry stay protected against this virus. I'm David Geiger reporting. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Bryant German and Sabrina Halverson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.